This first panel is going to focus on users and what we know from the research about users and how they interact with um, the existing notice and choice tools uh, that are out there. Um, we have um, a wonderful panel today. Um, we have Alicia McDonald from Stanford, Alessandro Acquisti from Carnegie Mellon, uh, Masuda Bashir from the University of Illinois, and Heng Yu from Penn State University. Um, and so uh, each of the panelists is going to speak for about um, eight minutes um, and talk about some of their research. And uh, then we are all going to come up here and have an interactive discussion. And so we have lots of time for questions and discussion after uh, all the panelists speak. And so um, please uh, think of your questions and, and your comments and hopefully we will um, really engage the audience for a lively discussion. So I'm going to uh, get started and uh, give you kind of a whirlwind tour of some of the um, privacy notice and choice uh, user studies that, that uh, we've done at Carnegie Mellon um, and some of this, this uh, privacy bird actually reaches back uh, before I started at Carnegie Mellon uh, to AT&T. Um, and uh, this was a, a tool that, that used the P3P standard and it put this little bird icon in the corner of your web browser so that you had a persistent indicator um, about uh, the privacy policy of the website. Um, and it's, this uh, had a, a wonderful uh, sound effect. Let me see if I can get this to actually play for you. That, that's the green happy bird. Trust me, there's a red angry bird there. <laughs> it's getting angrier. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay, so um, this was uh, not only a visual indicator of privacy, but also this kind of visceral indicator. And um, <clears throat> in all of the feedback that I got about Privacy Bird, I, I definitely got the strongest feedback about the sounds that, that played with it. Um, uh, so this was, uh, I think, one of, one of the first approaches to giving you that kind of very uh, small summary of the long privacy policy in your web browser. Um, and um, w the feedback that we got in our user studies is that users liked it, they understood it for the most part, um, but the problem they had is that when they went to a website, they often had either no bird because there was no P3P policy or the red angry bird cawing at them, and they said, well, how do I find the websites with the good privacy policies? And this tool didn't solve that problem. Um, we subsequently built what we called Privacy Finder, which was a search engine tool that when you did a, a search, um, and we did it with Google and Yahoo, um, your search results would be annotated with a privacy meter. And so then you could see at a glance uh, the, what types of privacy policies different websites had, and you could find the one with the best privacy policy. And uh, what we wanted to know was, does this actually help users? Is this information that will influence users? And so we did a study uh, where we asked people to make purchases in our lab. We gave them specific items to buy. We gave them money. And we told them that they could keep the change. And we wanted to know whether people would buy from the sites with the higher privacy scores, even if they were more expensive. Um, and what we found was that actually they would. And so this, I think, was the first um, evidence that uh, when you make privacy information really salient at the time when it's really relevant, people actually will act on this information. Uh, so that was, was kind of neat. Um, we, we also looked at, are there other ways of distilling these long privacy notices into something simple, not just that single icon, uh, something with you a little bit more information, but still simple. And we used nutrition labels as, as our model here. Um, as with food nutrition labels, having a standardized format makes it easy for people to understand where to find information, standardized language. Um, you know, we all didn't know what cholesterol was, you know, at first when we, we started using nutrition labels, but because it's the same language all the time, you eventually learn uh, what it means and where to find it. Um, you also want it to be brief and then linked to an extended view that gives you all the gory details and 99% of the time nobody is ever going to look at it, but it's there and if you do want to go look it up, you can go look it up and, and find that information. 
Um, we used an iterative design approach to develop the, uh, the nutrition label and extensive user studies to find out not just do people like it, but are they actually able to use it to find information and to compare privacy notices. Uh, we also did something similar uh, for Android. We have a privacy label for Android. And uh, we did a user study there where we asked people to um, pretend that they were downloading apps for a friend who'd just gotten a new Android phone. And we gave them pairs of apps to choose from. Uh, and we wanted to see whether they would actually make use of the privacy information as they were selecting the apps. Um, and what we found was that, in fact, um, in the versions that had privacy facts on the screen, people did make different choices. They made use of that information. Um, but that wasn't the only thing they looked at. So when we had an app that was a very well-known app or had a strong brand, that would also play a role and that might outweigh the privacy information. Um, financial privacy notices. Uh, so Fred mentioned all the trees that have been killed in the name of financial privacy notices from GLB. Um, uh, after um, that initial um, uh, uh, tree slaying, um, there were um, a group of eight federal agencies that came up with a standardized version of the financial privacy notice, which they suggested would be uh, a more useful approach. And uh, it was consumer tested and, and whatnot. Um, and so these are now out there and most financial institutions have voluntarily put them on their website. That, that is not um, required at all, but they've voluntarily done it. And so um, my students took the opportunity to go and crawl these websites and collect over 6,000 of them and put them in a database. And this now allows us to compare them. Um, and so we now have a website up, which, which we'll uh, be talking about um, in the poster session as well, where you can go and look up a financial institution's privacy policy and see it in this standardized format um, and also sort them to find out which ones have better practices. And uh, this is kind of a work in progress and we'll be interested in your feedback about what would make a tool like this more useful. Um, the NTIA had a multi-stakeholder process uh, last year on um, mobile app transparency, looking at uh, what, how they could standardize notices uh, in apps about privacy. Um, and they ended up developing guidelines for app privacy notices that would disclose seven data categories and eight third-party sharing entities. And the idea was that each app would indicate which of these would apply. And so there's an example here on the screen showing an app that collects three types of data and shares it with three types of third parties. Um, this was a, I think, about a year and a half process. Um, it involved, uh, it was multi-stakeholder, but most of the stakeholders were industry um, because they could afford to send people to monthly meetings in Washington. Um, and uh, this is a very user-facing um, set of guidelines. Um, but interestingly, there was absolutely no user testing that was as part of the process um, because I think there was no budget for it. And the group couldn't agree on what would be their metrics for doing user testing. Um, so basically, it didn't happen. Uh, one of my graduate students, Rebecca Balabaco, who is, I think, here in the back somewhere. There she, <laughs> there she is. Um, uh, so she uh, had been attending these meetings. And she came to me and said, can we do the user study? Um, and so um, she led a user study, um, which she'll be talking about. Um, and basically, the bottom line was that our study showed that the terminology is not well understood. Um, not well understood by average users, but even the experts that participated in our study didn't understand exactly what the terminology meant. Um, so this seems problematic for a user-facing privacy standard. Um, some other work that we did here was looking at the various approaches to opt out um, of online behavioral advertising. There are lots of opt out tools that are built into browsers, plugins to web browsers, websites. Um, and so we did a study to find out whether users understood what they were and could actually use them. We found a lot of problems. Um, a lot of them had default settings that confused users. Uh, there were um, lots of jargon and terminology users didn't understand in the interfaces. Um, there was misconceptions about what you were actually opting out of. A lot of these tools um, uh, will allow you to uh, opt out of, uh, of, of targeted advertising, but not out of actually being tracked. And that's really not clear to users. Um, also, the tools often require users to look at dozens or even hundreds of different online behavioral advertising companies and decide, OK, you can track me. You can't. You can't. You can't. And the users don't know who these companies are and really have no basis to make those sorts of decisions. 
Um, one of the uh, ways of opting out is through this ad choices icon um, that the industry developed. Um, and it appears in the corner of ads, much like that, see the top right corner of that ad, you can see a little itty bitty little icon. Um, we discovered in our, our laboratory study that users had never seen it, they, they didn't know what it did, and when we pointed it out to them, they were afraid to click on it because I wouldn't click on an ad, why would I click on that little icon that's on top of an ad? Um, so we did um, an online study um, with about a thousand people and um, we found out there that, again, people didn't know what it was. We asked them to try to you know, speculate on what it was, what it would do, and they had all sorts of ideas, most of which were completely wrong. Um, we also, th this icon usually has the word ad choices next to it, which is definitely meaningless. Um, we tried some other phrases, um, which actually did a lot better than ad choices, and ad choices was actually one of the worst possible phrases you could put next to it as far as um, being meaningful to consumers. Um, let's see. Uh, last uh, study I'm going to mention really quickly is we are looking at, well, what is it that users actually do care about? Um, uh, if you were going to extract just the critical bits out of a privacy policy to give people those high points, what is it that would make a difference in their decision making? Um, so we did a study looking um, at uh, online behavioral advertising tracking and the data that's associated with that. Um, and we, we uh, looked to see what were the things that were influencing users. Um, some of the things that, we, that seem to be most salient are the extent of sharing. So is the, um, is the ad company just, you know, Know, collecting that information and using it to immediately target an ad, or is it going to be shared further? Um, the retention period, how long are they going to keep that information, and the type of information that they're collecting. Um, there's lots more details uh, in the paper and, and uh, in our subsequent paper, which we have a poster on. And uh, that, that is it for me, and I'm going to turn it over to um, the rest of my panelists. And so Alicia McDonald is up next. Good morning, my name is Alicia McDonald. Uh, I'm at Stanford in the Center for Internet and Society. I did this work, the title actually comes from Ryan Kahlo while I was working for him. I was also uh, at Mozilla at the time with Tom Lowenthal, who was my coworker there. So uh, he was my co-author on the paper. And to take you back a couple of years, mobile privacy became very hot after a bunch of surprises, including Carrier IQ and the California AG's office did some very nice work getting commitments from half a dozen major app stores that they would require privacy policies for apps in the future. The FTC got involved and we had a lot going on. Everyone in the room is familiar with the idea that it's much harder to read a privacy policy on a small screen and there are a number of other reasons that mobile is more difficult including the number of sensors. So to get uh, into the, the study itself, uh, how many people have heard of the Firefox test pilot program? Yeah, see this is the question I should have asked before we ran this. Um, very few people. Uh, so, so this is open to everybody, to all researchers, but I learned a thing while I did this. The population using test pilot is very skewed. So these are people who opt in to helping with research uh, from the Firefox program from Mozilla. So they were male, geeks, and young. Um, so think about that as you hear the results from this. This does skew things. Where they were not different from being representative of the population was specifically on privacy. We asked the Weston segmentation questions and they came just slightly more concerned than the population as a whole. Um, but male, geek, and young. Okay, These are sort of the early adopter curve for things. So in some ways they are the best case for communicating technical privacy issues. So we split and sliced and diced them into a variety of different groups to do some, uh, some testing between different subpopulations and I'll talk through those as I go. So we asked about data collection and we said, imagine you are installing a wallpaper app onto your cell phone. So the app that you would expect to be least likely to be collecting and using data, right? Uh, and then we asked about data collection and yes, 
just about every type of data collection was a surprise, and you can see very surprised at the bottom here in the blue, and somewhat surprised directly above in red. The top in the teal uh, is very unsurprised. Now, even data stored by the app itself, by the first party, that was surprising to about half of the participants. Uh, the item that we thought would be closest to what people would expect would be photos for this type of app. And photos, still, we had um, about two-thirds of people would be surprised if photos were involved anyway with their, their wallpaper app. Uh, we picked how you voted because we were looking for an example that no app ever collected. And it turns out, as researchers, we were not sufficiently creative. Uh, we ran this in September, and within about six weeks after we closed the study, there was news about a new app that was asking people how they voted to be able to then propagate that out through their social networks and get other people to vote for candidates. So it's very difficult to actually come up with a class of data that's implausible for collection. So we also looked at when do people want to have notice. And we found that for the majority of cases, the idea of just-in-time notice is at the point of purchase. So before they install, they want to know if data is going to be collected and used. And that's shown as before purchase in the, the blue at the bottom here, uh, ranging from 40% from for the data stored by the app, which was uh, the type of thing that people would be least surprised by, uh, to 60% for passwords uh, for sites, which would be the most surprised. Um, Note along the top in the teal, there's a good solid 10% who say never. They just don't want to be notified. Leave them alone, right? They're installing the app, they're done. So that was interesting as well. Uh, and there's about 20% roughly for these categories who say they, they want notice for every point of collection, right? So this is what people say they want, right? Um, every point of collection. And that at first use and first collection, those were not very popular choices in the green and the purple. Those were not people, what people thought they wanted. So this surprised me. Uh, so you're probably familiar with the idea of creating short notices and on phones, privacy choice and trustee have very nicely packaged um, uh, setups where you check a bunch of boxes as an author and then it will generate a privacy policy based on that. It has icons, you can drill down, it looks very pretty. Uh, the question is, does this improve things versus natural language? And the answer was yes. For some of the questions, trustee did a little better. For others, privacy choice did a little better. But the overall picture, the, the blue is the percent correct. You can see the left two in each of these groups. Um, at the beginning, we have a huge improvement over natural language. And for the natural language, we didn't give people 17 small screens. We gave them one scrollable on their desktop device. So we even put our finger on the scale slightly in favor of natural language and it's still just lost for comprehension questions. So that was encouraging. But as the questions start to get more complicated, the last one is, will this app collect information about you, aggregate it with other users, and share it with a third party? Right? That's difficult to get across even in this room with an eight minute timeline. Um, users are just lost. It doesn't matter what format you give them. The concept is too difficult. So maybe there are still ways that, that trustee and privacy choice can be creative and find new ways to approach this, but for the moment, it's just baffling to people. And you can see the unsure percentage in green starts to climb there too. And even in the best case, we're looking at about 20% are unsure for these questions, even the most concrete things like, does this app uh, collect your, your location information? So when we started this research, I had the idea that when users hear the phrase personally identifiable information, which most of us have a concrete definition for sitting in this room, that users instead just think about that as information that's personal. And they don't think of PII as a separate concept. So I wanted to try to test that and split into two groups and ask people, are all of these categories of data personal? And the blue is yes, and that came back as yes for just about everything. Uh, which makes this a little challenging, including ads clicked. And about 45% said that the ads they click are personal. Uh, and the unique IDs and cookies, we had over 50% say, yep, those are personal. And the first many categories are statistically indistinguishable. The ordering doesn't really matter here. Uh, people think that their name or their phone number is personal. They think their location is personal. 
Uh, and it really starts to trail off as things get more technical. We get to device ID, IP address. Remember again, young male geeks. We gave definitions for IP addresses. If anybody will understand what that means, it's this group. Um, and they started to see those as being less personal than some of the other categories, but it's still the majority of people think it's personal. So then we ask the same question, but phrased it in terms of personally identifiable information, and we get basically the same graph. Right? Again, everything's personally identifiable information. Even ads clicked, we're getting you know, a third of people saying that the ads they click are PII, right? which is a really interesting result in contrast to how all of us in the room talk about PII. So to go through some implications quickly, the privacy policy generators are in a great place of leverage. They can help create better policies uh, in terms of comprehension of the easy questions. The hard things are gonna stay hard as far as we have so far. Um, so the other piece is that no matter how clickable and icons and pretty the format is, we still have 20% unsure at the best case for all of these questions. So huge improvement, still no cure for cancer. Um, so for the timing, this surprised me, this idea that just in time or contextual notice can be the point of purchase rather than later when data is collected or used. If I could go back and rerun this study, uh, it occurs to me after the fact that point of purchase may have been the wrong thing to ask. That implies a financial transaction. If instead I had asked about the point of installation, where that's free and free is a magic number, there might have been different results. So that would be a great area for future research. Uh, I was shocked that many users think they want notice every time. I would think by now most users realize that would be amazingly annoying. So the question I have is, what are the concerns they have behind that? Right? What is it that we can address for them that leads them to think they would want this dreadful sounding future? And can we address those in some other way? Uh, and again, we had this 10% who just don't want notice at all. They've installed a thing, they are done. Uh, it would be great to design for that 10% as well, rather than pestering them. For the wallpaper app example we gave, just about all types of data collection and use are surprise, even including things that might be related to wallpaper like the app's own data or photos. Uh, it might be very interesting to contrast different types of apps and see if there's a huge difference between a wallpaper app, something that you would expect to use your contacts, etc. I would imagine the answer is yes, there are differences there. It's not really clear that surprise is a good heuristic though when even the basic things surprise people. Uh, and finally, on personal information and PII, nearly all data categories we could come up with were seen both as personal and as PII, so I did not get to test my hypothesis. Uh, you know, they just were all personal, so that's kind of maxed out. Um, and the other piece on this is that when privacy policies state they do not collect PII, this may be extremely confusing to users who think that the world of data all fits under the PII concept. So if you tell them we don't collect PII and then describe all of the things you collect, this may just make no sense. Uh, also, it means that it may not make sense to treat PII and personal information as distinct categories, right? Uh, not just the Paul Ohm objection of you can get re-identification, but users aren't really distinguishing these at all. So thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> um, so I don't know if you ever read the best privacy notice of all time. My, my presentation will be thematically similar to uh, Fred's wonderful keynote, although perhaps a little gloomier, uh, <laughs> if that is even possible. <laughs> and definitely not as uh, um, exciting. However, I'll do my best. Imagine that you have um, written the best privacy policy of all time, just perfect. It's accurate, it's honest, it's truthful, it's short and yet complete. It covers all the important stuff and yet it does so in few paragraphs. So it's eminently understandable, uh, usable, uh, just in time, we arise at the perfect moment. Are you done? 
is uh, this good enough? I'm going to claim that sadly that's not good enough. And I'm going to show you why I believe that uh, through a series of examples from experiments we've been running uh, for the past few years or in some cases in the past few weeks. Uh, and the reason is that subtle yet common, meaning commonplace in the marketplace, in the online ecosystem, changes in the way we present either privacy choices or privacy settings or in fact privacy policies can in a way overrule, circumvent, uh, bypass, uh, or nullify the impact of a, a privacy policy. I'm using somewhat stronger terms than I should. Let's say that uh, there are these subtle changes which can indeed interact uh, and influence how we react to privacy policies. So I'm going to show you four very simple ways in which we can nudge people to reveal more about themselves, even when we give them very simple, usable, clear notices about what will happen to their data. First way to make people reveal more. Call privacy settings, something different. Very simple example of framing. Um, consider that this uh, happens every day online in that companies do have to make choices in terms of how to call privacy settings. And sometimes they call them privacy settings. Here we have Android uh, privacy screen, and sometimes they call it differently, location rather than privacy settings. So privacy and location is about privacy. In fact, uh, on the iPhone operating system, location is under privacy settings, under the Android operating system is not. Or another example from Facebook. Uh, every, everyone who uses Facebook, and I guess most uh, of us are in this uh, room, may remember this interface, privacy settings, and then it changed into this interface, settings. So would you think that subtle changes such as that may impact actual, actual disclosure behavior or whether users decide to protect themselves more or less? We try to test that in a series of experiments. I'm going to show you just uh, one. There is more from the paper, so I'm listing at the bottom of the slide. In this one, we did a very simple experiment in framing uh, we asked uh, uh, subjects to participate in a study. We told them that we, we wanted to use their personal information. And uh, we asked them whether they would allow certain users of their information. Only that in one case, we called, we put a title in the page where we were asking them, hey, do you allow us to do such and such? We put a title which said the privacy settings. In another of the experimental conditions to which subjects were randomly assigned, we called the very same question. The title was survey settings. And what we found that, sure enough, calling something survey settings decreased by 22% the probability the subjects would choose the more protective option in the sense of do not allow us to do such and such with their data. Because on the y-axis, what you see here is a percentage of subjects who chose the more protective option. So it's higher when you call it privacy settings. It's lower when you call it survey settings. How about this? Mix important stuff with unimportant stuff. So ask important questions, or all important questions, or ask important questions and not so important questions. Again, this is very common. And when I say it's very common, I don't imply intentionality or agency. I'm not saying that the industry is engaged, engaged, engaging this uh, deliberately. I, I have no knowledge of that whatsoever. I'm still pointing out in normative, in positive terms rather than in normative terms, uh, what can be the impact of making certain interface choices which go beyond the privacy policy itself. Uh, the reason being that indeed we often have to make decisions and some are more important such as maybe I do care whether Twitter has my location or not and I care much less about whether the weather app on my iPhone has my location or not. But when they are presented together in the same screen, one could interact with the other, one could affect the other. So. In another experiment, similar to the one I just showed you, we ask a number of different questions, which had been ranked in a previous pilot with a sample population from the same universe, but a different group of subjects from the ones who later participate in the actual experiment. We had asked them to rank these different options, and these are options that were ranked consistently important, things that people care. Whether or not we share the results with other participants of the experiments, for instance, something that people care. Whether or not we will share the answers with a religious organization is something that people care. Okay? In another condition, we kept the religious organization sharing point, but we mix it with three others. We actually were judged in the previous pilot as less important. So in one group, all the options were important. In the other group, one was important, the other three were not. 
And sure enough, what we found is that the number of subjects, ooh, for the important option, because we, are, we don't want to compare apple with oranges. Here we are comparing apple with apple. So the choice of will I share information with a religious organization. When all the options presented are important, 37% choose to share the information with a religious organization. Um, sorry, I say it the, 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 the other way around, because this is those who protect, those say, I don't want my data to be shared with, with a religious organization. When we said we present the same option, surrounded by less important option, it drops down by 55%. Only 15% of people now say, no, I don't want to share my information with a religious organization. Third way of getting people to reveal more, misdirect attention. And uh, uh, Fred, in a way, was getting at the same uh, point I was making. Uh, we, call, uh, we call these studies the uh, sleight of hand, kind of like the magician asks you to focus on the right hand so you don't see what happens on the left. Maybe we can do the same with privacy policies in the sense we can give very noticeable, very understandable, very usable notices with the right hand, and we change something at the same time with the left hand. For instance, in one study, this was with CMU uh, students. We asked them to participate in a survey about their academic behavior. The survey included sensitive and non-sensitive questions. The sensitive ones were, have you ever plagiarized a material? Have you ever cheated in an exam? And we told them, in one condition, other students will see your answers. In another experimental conditions, we told them, students and faculty will see your answers. And of course, the expectation would be that the telling people, so giving this notice, this disclosure information, which signal that also faculty would see their answers about cheating and plagiarizing would inhibit disclosure. So that we expected that disclosure rates would be higher in the first group and lower in the second group. And that's exactly what happened, in that when we give these very simple disclosures, this is what happens. People in the yellow bar, which are the um, uh, subjects who were assigned to the students only will see your answer condition, are more likely Y axis response rate are more likely to answer questions than people in the blue column, which is the group of subjects who are told students and faculty will see your answer. So if you stop here, the result is privacy notices work. You tell people how you're going to use the answers in a survey, people react rationally. If you tell them faculty will be there, people are less likely to answer questions about cheating and plagiarizing. The problem is that we don't stop there. Because most of the times, we don't make decisions immediately on privacy policies, if we even read them. And in any case, even if we read them, we are constantly bombarded by other signal, other stimuli, which may misdirect our attention. So we repeated the same experiment, uh, this time where we added a delay between the time we gave the notice, so we told, them, we told people how we would use their data, and we started asking the questions. Okay, so just a little delay. We have a little bar. Remember the old days in the internet where we, you see a bar slowly <laughs> uploading. Okay, only that the bar was just 15 seconds, and that indeed was enough to nullify the inhibitory effect of knowing the faculty will read your answer. Interestingly, this is not an issue of memory because we have a, a manipulation checks at the end. We know that it's not that the second group remembers less than the first group about what will happen to their data. Is that the issue of who is reading? their answers becomes less salient in their decision-making process. Fourth way of, not, of inducing people to reveal more, give them control. In a study that we did by now several years ago, we asked people to answer questions. We told them, hey, they are all voluntary, but if you answer, we are going to use your answer in our publication. In another group, we asked the same, but we added a little checkbox in which we asked them for permission to use the answers in our publication. The permission made people we expected feel agency and therefore feel control and therefore be more likely not just to answer the question but to allow their publication. And this is exactly what happened. Relative to the first group, the second group was twice as likely to answer the most sensitive questions. So in other words, I've shown you that we can decrease by half the probability that people choose protective settings by mixing important with unimportant options. We can increase by uh, 100%, almost 100% the probability they will answer sensitive questions simply by adding a checkbox, which really brings the issue of uh, what, how much can we rely on privacy policies. Well, maybe I was lying when I said this would be completely gloomy because like uh, Fred, I would like at least to end on a slightly nicer note or a happier note. A, on a note which I actually do happen to believe actually, which is uh, the very simple distinction we have all learned in 
mathematics classes in high school or logic classes in high school between a sufficient and a necessary condition to prove a theorem. And this is a terminology that both Laurie and I have been used in, 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 in uh, published articles. Uh, we, uh, and I guess Laurie has a similar view on this, uh, on this uh, as me, we believe that transparency and control are important. They are necessary, uh, but they are not sufficient condition. Because if you go back to the OECD guidelines that Fred also was mentioning in his uh, wonderful keynote, well, uh, transparency and choice, although called in other ways, they were, they were not called that way in the OECD 1970s uh, um, uh, documents, but they were pretty much transparency and notice, were part of a larger edifice, a larger uh, set of guidelines, which included data minimization, proposed specification, uh, stronger safeguards. If we only focus on two of the guidelines and forget the others. It's like building a house without strong foundations. So the way forward for me is uh, transparency and control, yes, we do have to do better and better work, more and more research on how to make control and transparency better, but we must avoid the mistake of considering that the, our job is done by focusing only on transparency and control because there are these other issues. And therefore, we have to consider OACP guidelines, uh, perhaps indeed the regulation, perhaps nudging mechanisms, uh, which I will not discuss because I only have eight minutes, but which are part of our other work uh, that we do uh, here at uh, CMU. Thanks. Good morning. Um, I'm Masuda Bashir from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and I'm going to present to you on online privacy agreement, is it informed consent? And this was work was done with Professor Jay Kaysen in the back and Carol Hayes Mullins, uh, our research associate. And um, we also wanted to understand uh, whether users really knew the information that was given to them. We know they don't read the, the privacy notices, the terms of service, but even if they read them, would they really understand the information that's contained in them? So that was our, one of our hypotheses. Um, I don't have to tell this group here about the complexity of understanding and studying and even doing research in privacy, right? It's a very multifaceted, complex problem, and the more I get to know it, the more I study it, the, the more I understand how difficult and complex it is and that there's so many facets to it that we can explore. Um, there's different notions of privacy, um, you know, whether it's privacy as a negative freedom, secrecy paradigm, lots of literature and conceptualizations that have been uh, down, uh, done previous to us. Um, and is it an invasion paradigm? Is it more of an accessibility versus, you know, control of information? Privacy viewed as a constitutional inhuman right. More and more we see this, this kind of debate going on, especially outside of the US. Um, there's a lot of uh, you know, um, reaction and movement in this direction. And we also have several scholars that have looked at privacy and conceptualized it for us in much more broader terms. And I tend to go back to these conceptualizations to see if my research can benefit and I can understand the, the, the problem area better. Um, we know that the right to be left alone, long time ago, right, one of the classic uh, writings that have happened uh, in, in uh, privacy many years before all of the technological developments that we've had. Um, there's also, you know, econo economists uh, like Posner that says a self-serving economic good. Um, there is contextual integrity that Helen Nissenbaum uh, writes about, and then uh, Solovo mentions it is a, it's a taxonomy of different yet related problems. So again, lots of conceptualization, lots of um, definitions out there, and lots of area of research um, to ponder on. So what we wanted to do is uh, look at privacy in the cloud. Um, as we have been mentioned before by Fred and other speakers in the panel, um, we know that a lot of company, industry, even government agencies, um, you know, once you sign on and you click agree, it's kind of a legal um, binding between you and that other entity. And the other entity assumes that you have given them consent now and they can do whatever they want with your data and your information. And uh, really, all the things that they can do beyond that point to, you, to your data, about your data, and sharing of your data is considered informed consent and something that you've agreed on. And we wanted to um, look into that problem uh, from the cloud uh, provider's point of view. 
So what, one of the first studies we did that I want to don't won't go into too much uh, detail here just because of uh, time is we actually looked at the terms of service and privacy agreements of several cloud providers. So uh, we had um, Carol and some other students who had the energy and uh, and uh, dedication to actually download the privacy agreements and start looking at them and dissecting them and putting them into tables and doing analysis on what kind of terms were there, what kind of privacy protections were there, and uh, what information. Um, you know, was what type of protections were guaranteed to the users and what kind of protections did the company own and said, we have all, you know, what we can do with your data. And what we found uh, from an, our analysis, and we looked at 15 different uh, cloud providers, and they were the top cloud provider services uh, uh, at the time, uh, we found that companies generally include similar provisions in their policies. A lot of them talked about similar kinds of things like uh, how's your data uh, shared to other parties, uh, what kind of security measures are they going to use to protect your data, those kind of things. A lot of things that were mentioned like um, industry standard for your security of your data, just industry standards, what we're going to use. Wasn't sure what that meant exactly, what kind of protection you were given. We also found that companies tend to be more v vague about the control that consumers had over their um, data and information than what the kind of control that they had on that data. Um, they also relied on advertising. Those companies that relied on advertising, uh, which provided free or cheap services, had a lot more say in language about what they were going to do with the data and how much control they had over the data. So our overall findings uh, were to indicate that consumer choice, informed consent, uh, data withdrawal rights, all of these were topics that we studied in, in those terms of service and privacy agreements. We found that there was you know, lots of issues with each of these topics and not everybody, for example, give you a data withdrawal rights at all. Like It wasn't shown how you were going to delete their account and how you were going to get some of your data back, for example. So the two things that we wanted to focus on our next research study that I'm going to present here in a minute is consumer choice and informed consent that our other speakers here have talked to as well. And so in the U.S., again, um, I don't want to go into detail in this. As you all know, you're well informed about all of this. Is, uh, you know, it is from the FIPS, and we look at notice, choice, and consent are some of the big things that we look at. And one of the questions we had was, is it really informed consent? So you're reading this document. Most of us are not reading it, right? Our majority of people are not reading it. We found that in our survey as well. What, what if they were reading it? Would they understand the information there? Do they have the background knowledge and understanding and, and materials to really give informed consent? Um, so that's what uh, we wanted to study and we, of course, used some previous um, findings to guide that research. Um, so our research question was, what does the average person know about online privacy, right? So, and to our knowledge, there was no other study that have actually assessed people's knowledge, and so we wanted to this do the, to do this research before others. What do consumers understand about cloud computing, for example, right? A lot of the social networking side, a lot of the computing and services that we use are on cloud providers now. So we wanted to learn a little bit more about what they understood, you know, was their data locally, for example, stored or was it somewhere else and what kind of, you know, connection was there, you know, was it on the internet or was it on their local drive, things like that. Do consumers understand how their personal information is used by cloud service providers behind the scenes, right? Questions about what happens to their, your data once it's saved. Are consumers concerned about the availability and distribution of their personal information? So we did an opinion section as well where we asked their consumers um, about what they wanted to do. And if they were given a, a choices, would they make different decisions? So we designed a two-part um, online survey. Um, first part was knowledge, and second part was opinions. We did shift that once in a while to get more data. Um, and of course, we got uh, demographics and other things. But we made the scenarios a third person. So Alice and Bob were talking to each other, and Alice is describing these kind of questions. So it's a little bit more removed. And we thought people might have a, an easier time answering some of these questions. And again, it was distributed mainly at our campus. So. Um, the, the results are skewed a little bit because it's highly <laughs> educated. Uh, we talk, uh, had five sections. We had questions uh, about cloud computing, online security, economic aspects, educational records, legal aspects of online privacy. We particularly put the educational records because, again, being that it was an academic setting and that we were going to distribute to students, we were hoping or wanting to find out how much they knew about the protection of their educational records, which would be something very important to them. We wanted to find out. And as you can see, we had about uh, 455 people. Um, the distribution of genders were pretty equally there. And um, age and uh, religion, all of that was given as well. 
What we found uh, was that uh, the overall scores, as you can see, is 59.5. That's the average score for the overall if we look through the different sections. And this is with you know, a very highly educated population. A lot of, about 30% of our respondents were actually had gra were in graduate school already. And this was also, um, you know, in a very high-tech university, uh, University of Illinois, other by Champagne. So we think our results are actually quite a bit skewed because of these uh, other uh, confounding factors. Um, we looked at, you know, cloud computing, for example, people did okay with that. Um, we were surprised to see how well people knew the economics of the internet. So they knew how companies were making money, why they were getting these free services, right? They knew that the ads were how the companies were making money and they were giving their information. So that was uh, an interesting finding. Um, we saw that online security again in the 60s. So again, these are college educated graduate level students. So um, what I like to do is deploy this to non-college educated populations and see what kind of results we get. Uh, I bet if the results would be even lower. Um, surprisingly, educational records was one of the lowest scores that people got. Uh, students and the uh, respondents of this survey did not know much about at all about what the laws were or what the protections were for their educational record, who had access, who can access, who can ask for their information. Those kinds of things were uh, not well known. And of course, the legal aspects were also not very well known. And so. Uh, there was another piece of information. As you can see, the distribution was that uh, we had about 64 that had grad level degrees. So this is very surprising, this knowledge base. And again, the mean distribution was also um, pretty much uh, similar. Um, we also asked people about their opinions, right? People love to give their opinions. We want to also know what their uh, ideas were, not just knowledge. So we thought it would be a good distribution of things. So we, about, we asked about online behavior, like how many hours are they using the internet, what kind of things they do. Um, because previous surveys had found that people were asked if they used cloud computing, and they'd say no, and then they'd say, yes, I use Facebook. So we wanted to ask some of those um, questions. Um, again, we had a higher number taking the opinion, actually, because it was probably a little bit easier to take, perhaps, or less time consuming. And we had some good distribution there. Um, and some, again, a very snapshot of, uh, for, for the uh, sake of time, we have lots of other opinions that were given, but some of these were, uh, we thought, interesting. Have you ever submitted information online but wished that you did not have to? You can see that uh, a majority of our respondents said yes, they didn't really want to. They didn't think they had a choice. It's not voluntarily. They have to give it. To get the service, they have to give this information. So they didn't have that. Have you ever decided not to use a website strictly because of the website's privacy policy or terms of service? And again, a majority says yes multiple times. So maybe there is the, some good news here too, that maybe more readers are paying attention to this and that um, are making different choices. Have you decided not to use a website strictly because of the website's privacy policy or terms of service? And um, I apologize, you can't see the bottom there. But again, yes, multiple time, uh, times. And then there's yes, only a few times. And the majority said that, yeah, that, that didn't really matter to them. That was not something that they um, got. If a cloud service provider were to adopt a new policy that gives users different options for their privacy setting, would you um, do this? And the majority said, 72% said that they would get fewer features in return for increased control over their personal information. So again, that choice, that voluntariness needs to perhaps be changed for people to see this. Um, so future uh, research uh, directions, of course, lots of human-computer interactions, interface user studies that can show how can we provide this information in notice, uh, notices in terms of service so people can uh, read them more often, hopefully. But more importantly, we think that some kind of assessment of knowledge might be important. So the same template shouldn't be given to everyone. And perhaps if there was some kind of a quiz or some kind of check mark, or some kind of assessment that took place where you understood where the user was and if they had any technical knowledge, any information about how information was being collected, how it was being shared, that then perhaps the terms of service privacy policies can be altered or customized and personalized to that person's uh, particular needs and that may be uh, more read, hopefully, and more uh, productive and, and constructive. Uh, we, this also has, of course, uh, investigate potential implication of policy level changes, right? Is it, if it's not really informed consent, people don't really know even what they're consenting to, uh, assuming that they're reading the, the information, which we know is not happening, but even if they read it, if they don't understand what they're signing and what they're consenting to, um, that's a huge uh, policy level type of thing that can uh, be researched. Um, and so that's uh, you know standardized format. Um, there's been studies and other research that's been done to see if we can standardize terms of service pol privacy policies, if that helps. We think all of those things can help, and those are all great ideas. 
but perhaps knowledge assessment and personalizing uh, privacy policies in terms of service may take us to another level. Um, personally, I also would like to study more the psychological factors of uh, human beings and how they make choices and how they see privacy. Why is it not as important as it should be with all the risks that we have out there? That's it. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. My name is Feng Shui uh, from Penn State. As some of you know that um, now, right now, I'm wearing another hand, which is uh, I'm a, prog a program director from the National Science Foundation, working for the uh, Secure and Trustworthy Cyberspace Program. But today, in this event, I'm only wearing my hat of a researcher from Penn State. Um, this is a joint piece of work with uh, my uh, uh, Penn State gra graduate students, Na Wang and Bo Zhang, and also Postal Pam, and also uh, Jens, I believe, who is here. Yes. Uh, yeah, my dear collaborator Jens is also here uh, today. Uh, so when we talk about privacy, or in this particular case, I think uh, pre previous speakers has already shared their perspective about notice and choice and the definition of privacy, consideration of privacy. So here I want to give you a kind of a case analysis in terms of Facebook applications. And we have been working on you know, redesign the privacy notice uh, in the context of uh, Facebook third party applications. But first, when we talk about privacy, what do we mean by privacy? Here is a, some quick examples from the literature review from different fields. For example, in the law uh, field, privacy has been defined as a right. And in computer science, privacy has been studied as the ways to address anonymity-related solutions. And in social psychology, marketing, and also as well as my, uh, my, my home field, which is a management information systems, we often see the frequent linkage between privacy and control. We either you know, study you know, privacy as control or study you know, control as a significant predictor of privacy. So it seems that the kind of interdisciplinary review of privacy hasn't been helpful in terms of providing a one-size-fits-all type of definition of privacy. And here is my uh, favorite quotes from 70s, you know, li privacy literature review, which, you know, Magui's 1977 mentioned that privacy scholars do not agree on what privacy is or on whether privacy is a behavior, attitude, process, goal, state, or what. So the question is, Privacy, you know, nobody can understand privacy. So this is exactly the conclusion from Daniel Solov, who wrote a uh, conceptualization privacy article in the year of the 2006. So what we should do in terms of implementing, you know, notice and choice uh, in the practice, since we get no help from the academic literature, then probably we should turn to some practical guidelines. For example, the most recent practical guidelines would be from this White House uh, report on privacy, which Fred has mentioned that, you know, from the uh, proposed U.S. Consumer Privacy Bills of Rights, which apparently highlighted transparency and control. Uh, in this case, I think transparency and control corresponding to the notice and choice from the early version, early version of fair information practices uh, principles. So uh, this government guideline also highlighted the importance of trans transparency and control. And then how to implement this in the context of uh, Facebook applications. So here are some screenshots. On the left hand side, you can see that that's the current design of the third party application, you know, the privacy permission window for the third party applications on Facebook. And I think this is a, a reasonable way of implementing transparency, right? Because this exactly tells users that what kinds of information will be collected in the context of installing this particular app. But how about choice? Is there any choice? Yes, it does provide choice by providing the button either, you know, installing the app or leaving the app. So apparently that's the only choice um, this type of uh, privacy notice afford to the users. So we were thinking about how about, you know, on the basis of existing, you know, privacy permission window from the Facebook, you know, which provides transparency, can we add choices on top of that? 
So we're looking into the design choice literature. We decided to experiment with these little you know, check boxes to clearly highlight you know, what types of personal information will be collected in the process of installing the app. But we encounter another set of problems. If you can see from the right-hand side, these are the exactly identical uh, interfaces, but in two different kinds of uh, you know, applications. If we presented this type of window to the users, they are exactly identical to the left-hand side, right? Because by default, they have been all checked. So if users won't pay, you know, according to Fred's talk this morning, and users won't pay attention to these little cues, they probably will quickly, you know, click on go to the app and install the app. So it still may not provide a lot of choices in this kind of uh, uh, context. So the question uh, is, you know, will this transparency and control working in terms of our new, uh, proposed redesigns? Then we are keep thinking about another set of questions, right? So when we design these little boxes, we were thinking about, you know, defaults may matters because a lot of literature showing that uh, users pay little attention to those design choices, uh, pay little attention to those privacy cues. And it's probably more important for developers and designers to think about what kind of ethical design choices we should design embedded with those interface design. Uh, we believe that defaults, the reasonable defaults, may help in terms of privacy decision making because we believe defaults can relieve users from the burden of making decision in terms of privacy. And this is likely to be true in, from the theory of endowment effects, which suggests that people are usually less willing to give up something they already have. So we try to experiment with different choices of defaults in the context of Facebook application and to see what worked and what didn't. So here comes our experimental design. Uh, in terms of defaults, we have three different sets of uh, design choices. One is opt-in, which means that for all of those, you know, little boxes, little check boxes we design for this uh, privacy permission window, we by default, it's opt-in and unchecked, except for the profile information, which means that the user's basic information, which is kind of you know, collected by all applications. But then for the others, like say, for example, for the photo apps, you know, the photos and um, re relevant other informations would be unchecked. And then the second design choice we, we experiment here is the minimum necessary. So for example, in the context of photo app, we believe that you know, collecting the user's basic information plus photos or photos shared with this particular user would be the minimum necessary or would be highly relevant to the context of photo app. But then other information such as user's birthdays would be unnecessary for a photo app to ask to request from the users. And then the third condition is opt out, which means that we provide, we, we actually, uh, by default, we all checked these uh, uh, little check boxes and means that, you know, the photo app would collect all the information, not only, you know, profile information, photos, but also, you know, irrelevant, irrelevant information such as uh, user birthdays. And in addition to these three different kinds of, you know, uh, default choices, we are also very interested in looking into the context factors because privacy is a contextual concept. So we also add another experiment factor, which is the application context. So we have two different types of apps. One is photo app, the other is a birthday app. So we have this two by three between subject design, and then we implement through the Chrome uh, browser extension. So we Follow the concept of man in the middle attacked from security literature, and we, as researchers, acted as the so-called ethical man in the middle <laughs> through the uh, developing a Chrome browser extension that uh, mimic Facebook's current privacy notice dialogues. And in the experiments, we do uh, ask all the subjects to install a Chrome extension, our own Chrome extension before the experiment. And then during the experiment, we ask them to log into their um, own Facebook accounts and uh, try to make you know, decision making for the specific ta uh, uh, applications. 
So here are some preliminary results. We are just finish, finishing up the data collection. So here are some preliminary results I want to highlight. In terms of effects of default settings, settings and participant in the opt-out condition perceive higher levels of privacy risks, but also disclose more information. So what does this mean? The preliminary results from our experiment seems to suggest that designing ethical defaults might be more important in the you know in, in order to empower users with transparency and choice because they do little action uh, in the context of opt out. Um, in terms of effects of app contacts, we, our results suggest that the default settings in the birthday app trigger higher level of risk and higher levels of perceived usefulness than that of photo apps. So it seems that context also matters in terms of users' privacy decision making in the context of Facebook third party apps. And I will stop here and uh, I would like to entertain any questions. I also have the poster about more results of this study. All right, so um, we would uh, welcome some questions and discussion from the audience. Um, I have questions too, but I'd rather hear your questions. So um, anybody like to get started? Come on. You all have been sitting here. I know you have questions. Uh, uh, Norman. So, so we're, we're discussing that both of have given great presentations and, and clearly I think we've gained a lot more insight into the unit challenge when it comes to, to privacy and I think that was well illustrated in, in your presentations. Uh, but a lot of what we were hearing uh, earlier this morning uh, was in the context of a specific broadly experience or specific application. Do you see a need for more generally educating users? Is it possible to do everything you want to do purely in context? Or is there a need above this to somehow uh, educate people, raise awareness? Right? So it's one thing to put ugly pictures on cigarette uh, packs, for instance. But beyond that, there's been other efforts, I think, that have complemented these things. So are we in a similar situation when it comes to privacy? <coughs> Uh, okay, I'll, I'll start. I'll, um, I, you know, personally, yes, I believe uh, user education is important. But uh, similar to what, uh, to my conclusion, to the conclusion of my uh, presentation related to transparency and control, it's necessary, not sufficient. Uh, there are some uh, uh, dangers in uh, um, which arise when we rely only on user education. Uh, as a solution of privacy or other problems. For instance, Lauren uh, Willis, she's a law scholar, I believe currently at Loyola University perhaps. She has a paper, the title is quite funny, Against Financial <coughs> Literacy. Her point, uh, strongly put, I may not fully agree, but it's an interesting point, is that uh, we should have, uh, not actually focus on financial literacy because the, the the unintended effect is that we responsibilize uh, people for a problem which is much larger than what each of us individually, rather than as a, as a, as a society, can deal with. Uh, it's a strong point. I may not go there I, because I do believe that user education is important, but again, the risk is uh, thinking that, oh, we put the notice, we educate the users, we made them aware we are done. No, we are not done at all because uh, there is framing, there is default effects, which can have a more powerful, sometimes, sometimes more powerful impact than education and awareness. Uh, I also want to just comment to that question quickly. I think it's important to um, let the users know that they have to see the bigger picture of what it means for all of this data collection and sharing and what kind of consequences can come out of this. So, for example, big data and some of these other new technologies. Um, it's almost incomprehensible to most of us humans to understand all the computations that can happen and all the data sources that we give data to that we'll be sharing with each other and kind of what kind of consequences and conclusions can be made from those. So understanding the ramification and the consequences, perhaps you know, discriminations and other things that can come about from this kind of data sharing and out of context uh, use of data. 
do you think the uh, uh, standardization of the concept of the notice would be helpful in some way? Uh, do you think, if yes, I mean, do you think the standardization would be uh, feasible? So it's an interesting question. It's a trade-off between standardization versus privacy um, as a contextual integrity issues, right? So all of know that privacy, you know, per perceptions or uh, the perceptions of privacy violations are highly contextual. And so the challenge would be how to develop a standardized privacy standard or um, privacy compliance uh, to solve all those issues. It might be very challenging. Um, maybe, you know, some people can develop certain intelligent solutions that the designs can be customized based on users' contacts. So it's more like a situational awareness type of privacy settings, but I doubt that is kind of uh, feasible at this moment. If, feasible, if it would actually work and help people, I think the pushback from industry would be tremendous. <laughs> and I'll cite to Laurie's uh, experience with P3P. Uh, that was exactly an effort around standardized, and there was all of the pushback you'd expect. Uh, there are several people in the room who could uh, speak about the more recent experience around Do Not Track. Um, yeah. So if it would work well, there would be great incentive lined up to make sure that it didn't happen. Yeah, I'm going to add that. Um, I, I think it would work well if, if it could happen. Um, I think there, there's a lot of advantages to standardizing these things. Um, uh, not only that um, people will get to better understand them because they, you, you get used to it and you know where to look for things, but also it enables the development of automated tools so that we don't have to actually go and read a zillion notices and make a zillion um, choices, but we can actually set up our tools to make choices for us. Um, and I think that's great. But, but we have seen kind of a failure of being able to reach consensus on standards. And I think the, um, the financial privacy notice is um, an exception. And it, I think the reason it happened is it didn't go through a standards process. Um, but basically, the FTC hired consultants to come up with a draft. Then there was a call for public comments. They revised the draft. And I think the whole process took like six years. But they did actually conclude after six years with something which actually Actually has been adopted for I mean it's not perfect but it's adopted and that's unusual uh, over here oh. yeah. uh, so I really like the idea of guidelines as sort of uh, the way we can standardize at least within <coughs> excuse me at least within companies um, and I was wondering uh, uh, what efforts that you're seeing have the most promise? Um, I saw that uh, you know in the Firefox test pilot there were the the short, short notice concept, which is being adopted by various uh, various companies, including Google. Um, but that things tend to fall off when there's an <coughs> aggregate uh, and things get more complex. And um, I was wondering on what your thoughts were in terms of design and research for aggregate and making, making that more uh, approachable. So I think that was um, about the presentation that I gave. Mm -hmm. um, to come back to Norman's uh, question about education and Alessandro's answer, there are some pieces where we might want to ask ourselves, is this worth trying to educate users about yeah. or not? Um, and in some cases, we may be able to do from, from some of the types of studies Laurie's done, we may be able to say, look, 85% of users would really prefer the following setting. Why don't we start there, set that as the defaults, and we've had some great uh, discussion about the importance of defaults. Mm -hmm. um, for the things that are more complicated that we think it's worth educating users, we probably have a very small window of just a couple of things we can stress and get across. Uh, how difficult is it for all of us to stay up on all of what's going on and how the privacy landscape is changing month by month? Um, at this point, my mom understands that data is stored on her hard drive. Right? 
I have been working on her for years. <laughs> um, so there's, there's kind of only so much that you can do, even when you have a captive audience on the phone every week. Um, so we might want to think in terms of softer or harder paternalism, rather than trying to educate the world about all things and give them all choices. I think that's just a path to failure. Or, I mean, I just want to add something that maybe we can try some simple ways of promoting privacy awareness, such as wear a privacy dress. Opening <laughs> 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 up a privacy fashion show to promote this uh, of privacy awareness. And, uh, to go back again uh, to Fred's uh, talk this morning, uh, one of uh, your points, I believe, and correct me if I'm uh, reporting correctly some of, the, some of your ideas, so, some of your remarks was that there are some instances where uh, um, paraphrasing or expanding what you were saying, some instances in which education awareness and choice will be important, others where they may be unimportant, others where they may even be uh, damaging or not beneficial at all. Uh, one example I use, I've used in the past in our panels is this concept in economics of rational ignorance. There are scenarios where it is actually rational to remain ignorant yeah. because the costs involved in becoming learned, in becoming experienced about the topic are not going to be offset by the benefit of that uh, additional knowledge. Uh, because perhaps the problem is too large or perhaps even if you know, you cannot really protect yourself, which is pretty much correctly the situation. Going once again back to first talk, uh, you can know what after the upgrade iTunes is going to do with, uh, you know, after the upgrade of the operating system, what it's going to do, but you really have no, no, no real choice. So why even bother in reading all these pages of notices when you know that the only option is either keep the brick, your phone is a brick, or upset the notice. Why spend the time reading the notice? Exactly. Thank you. that. Yeah. So, uh, Fred, I think you mentioned the ideas of okay, human psychology, human weaknesses. The same battles we are fighting, you know, ever since you know humankind is is weakness, security awareness and I mean we have been telling not to, you know, click that. It happens, right? So so we all have the weaknesses. So that's a understanding everybody cannot refute. Okay. Regardless of the awareness policies, people are going to do certain things. So so that's on the uh, one end of the spectrum. Uh, and then also comes freedom of choice, freedom of rights. So you expect the person to be personal when it comes to the privacy, their definition. So, so that's one jargon of thoughts, right? So you expect the humans to make their own decisions. And the other spectrum is most of them don't know how their data is going to be used, right? Because the way the advertising model is, how the information is mined and crawled. So uh, you cannot expect an average user to know how the data is going to be used. So, if you go to the other end of the spectrum, uh, perhaps we should have like a reputation of uh, economic impact metrics, you know, saying, hey, this is the implication, this red. That means, you know, this could be uh, maliciously used, uh, or what are the probability of having that data uh, resulting in certain, uh, you know, like impact, you know, the user. So I was thinking something like a model would be extremely useful because the, either the company or the middleman should do those uh, homework and tell the user, hey, you know, if you're going to be going to this network, here's the implication or the probability of getting the penalty so high. You know? mm -hmm. And I, I just, somewhere in there, the balance lies, I feel like uh, the, all the other things, awareness to psychology to technology. You know? So any thoughts on that, you know, as a model? Well, I would think that simplifying the information, like using color coding, like you're suggesting, perhaps green, red, whatever, um, and putting some of the responsibility on industry, and rather than always on the user, that might be a very good way of going about it. We can get by it so that they can advertise, and hopefully as privacy becomes more uh, important and pressed by society, talked about that these companies would see it as a seal of some kind of good behavior, you know, and that they can advertise that and say, I you know, protect your privacy and then give themselves perhaps some kind of a rating. Uh, but again, there might be an independent body that rates them or looks at it. And that may help people, again, have some kind of a reputation based or live by the views or however we come out uh, to do it. But yeah, I, I agree that the more simplified it is and the more available it is to just the average user, they're more likely to use it and, and pay attention to it. Two anecdotes uh, as to why I think you're right to put it in work. 
Um, so you're getting at the notion of information asymmetries. The companies know things, the individuals don't. That leads to market failure. It's a point of intervention. Great. Here's the problem. The companies don't know. Uh, in California, where we can still pass laws, the ACLU pushed for a revision of the Shine the Light Act. And the idea was that companies would disclose what information third parties collected on their site and how those third parties used it. And the companies, the first parties, have no idea. You have real-time auctions. They don't even know which third parties are on their site. There is no entity you can go to and ask, excuse me, where did my data go? Because there is no entity aware of that. Um, even more troubling to me, I talked to a chief privacy officer of a major company you've heard of, and the chief privacy officer explained that the regulations being pushed in Europe were completely ridiculous because their company had no idea what cookies they set or what the data get used for. Uh, they've had a series of acquisitions, they've outsourced, they've insourced, they've had different products that have happened and coalesced and used the same cookies and don't. Um, they really didn't know what their internal practices were. Uh, my response to that was, okay, but I think it's your job to find out, very politely. Um, but that's extremely difficult for CPOs with uh, limited resources. I've heard of one CPO who finally held a contest, and it was, please tell us what this cookie does, and if you can, we will enter you for dinner. <laughs> and, and very nice dinner for two. Uh, in the end, they wound up still with a bunch of cookies. They had no idea what they did. They just pulled them, right, and listened for the screams <laughs> and waited to see what would break. So we have the problem where if you're saying, hey, we need companies to tell people what they do, that's great. But the companies don't know, and they certainly don't know the entire ecosystem. They don't even know their own part. That's hard. Um. Knowledge of um, which biases or heuristics uh, affect uh, people's decision making in privacy and other things can be used in at least three ways. One is uh, you can exploit the bias to extract more from the transaction with that person. So you take advantage of the bias. Um, the second is uh, you try to uh, counter the bias. There is this research on de-bias. Once you know that people fall for certain uh, very simple tricks or heuristics, then uh, you try to set up a system which counter, counters these bias. The third way, the third way to use it is to exploit the bias, but theoretically in the interest of the individual or in the interest of the consumer, which is also the research on nudging. And this opens up certainly questions about uh, individual freedom and uh, agency or autonomy. Is a fascinating but long discussion. Happy to have it offline uh, if uh, uh, you and others are interested in. All right, uh, I saw a hand all the way in the back. Yeah, yeah, you. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't know if this is actually working or not, but I'll just see. Yeah, it is. Awesome. So, when we talk about asking companies to provide more information to consumers about the uh, impact of their choices, whether that's monetary or not, um, it also strikes me that. In addition to what Alicia said about the companies not knowing what they're doing, uh, the companies might not know the impact of that disclosure. I'm curious how we would expect a company to know that. So for example, um, if I'm a, a startup app and I'm collecting your location to show you on an app and show your friends, I have no idea what the impact of that is to you financially, if, if any. Uh, maybe there's some under breach, but certainly Target didn't expect to get breached. Um, or if you're sharing a photo of you totally smashed after a party on Friday night, I don't know what the impact of that is to you. It might be different if you're an undergrad versus if you're the chief privacy officer. So I don't know. I'm curious, how much of a burden is it fair to expect companies to take on in those contexts in terms of how users understand the impact of their actions? Oh, I just want to comment quickly. I think uh, it's just like having, I mean, these companies' information is what their product is, right? And how they share that information, how they use that information is part of what how they make their money, right? How they make their revenue. So knowing... I disagree strongly. <laughs> I don't totally disagree with that. I think that there are some companies, like ad companies, for whom that's totally true, that is where they make their revenue. But if you come to Silicon Valley, there's a ton of companies who make no money whatsoever. They're just trying to get a bunch of users and then get bought up by another company. There is no, there is no money being made. And so I think when we talk about um, privacy, really those are small companies that probably don't have a great privacy and security program in place, maybe you should be a bit more worried. 
Um, I think when we start talking about these one-size-fits-all approaches, it's really easy to think about the Googles, the Facebook, the ad networks, but we often forget about the fact that what people are installing today is WhatsApp, Snapchat, all these startups that, um, frankly, are not in the money-making business. Well, still, if, if anyone is collecting your information and data, then they're responsible to at least protect it in some way and responsibly give it to another party or at least know which other parties are getting it or they're using it for. So um, that's the amount of responsibility that I'm talking about, if, whether they're making money or not. But that's not happening, obviously, because there's a lot of gold companies. Apps are being developed, lots of sensitive information is being collected, yet no one is really owning or saying, I own this data or I'm going to share it with someone. And, now I'm the holder of it, or so and so is now the holder of it. So there's this passing of the buck, you know, who owns this data, who, who can share, who cannot, and that's why I think we have a, bit, a lot of chaos right now. Okay, um, I, I want to move on to the next question, uh, Joanne. I, I think I understood that some uh, discussion in the PCAS Big Data Report, uh, a reference to something like privacy profiles, sort of an uh, a very big version of the privacy bird in a way that that, that people could um, opt into or choose. I want the ACLU privacy profile and, and it would be in an automated sense, would communicate that the way a do not track signal falls on deaf ears today, but that by presenting th that profile out to the world that the market could Respond. Well, a lot of people are saying they want this, so we're going to offer them this. A lot of other people are saying they want that. Did I understand that correctly, or is that an idea that is viable from a technical perspective? So a, a quick comment on that is, um, so that idea has been around for a while. Um, with P3P, um, we wanted that to happen. Um, there, there was the notion that that companies like ACLU and CDT would provide these profiles. None of them ever did. Um, when Microsoft introduced tracking protection lists, they also had the idea that this would happen. Um, I believe Trustee actually came up with, with a profile, um, and a couple other organizations did, um, but nobody else did, and tracking protection lists were so difficult for users to understand that it never went anywhere. Um, so I think it's an idea that seems like a good idea, but in practice, um, both I think because of implementation problems and um, I, I also have sensed resistance from some of these organizations in saying, well, we don't want to tell people what their settings should be. And, um, and, and it's on the one hand, they, they are advocacy organizations and they are going around and telling people what they should think, but they don't necessarily want to build it into the technology and it's not entirely clear why. May I also add that there has been war by uh, Norma Salem, indeed Laurie and others so trying to uh, uh, infer and create these privacy personas so that there is no one size fits all, but based on certain behaviors you can infer what the uh, privacy type uh, of the, this person is and try to therefore create settings which may match uh, the type. Uh, this has been done. Please. Yeah, perfect. So it sounds to me that we are talking about these agency issues. Mm -hmm. Who should be responsible for the privacy consequences and outcomes? Should the user themselves or certain responsible third parties such as trustee, right, who developed a kind of, uh, you know, the best privacy settings for the users? Or should be uh, the government legislators to just push out a law to regulate everything? and then let industry comply to that. So it's more like, I mean, to me, it's more like an agency issues. Or there might be other, you know, solutions like, uh, I like, I personally like the collective agency kind of idea, which means that, you know, if I don't know something about this, but I may just follow the, the mass or the most of my friends about their privacy settings. So there could be some uh, solutions to try to derive you know, most of my friends' privacy settings and recommend it to me, and then I just simply follow that. All right, so I think I'm going to wrap it up here um, so that we can move on to um, the next agenda item. Um,